Father, we just thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together to study your word and to learn more about your desires for us. We just thank you for the many blessings that you give us just continually. You bless us all so richly. We just uh, ask that you be with uh, Tim as he presents the lesson to us and help him to encourage us and to follow you in a, a more closely way. Just continue to go with us and guide us. And it's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. One other thing. If uh, somebody, when they set these uh, chairs up, they put an, uh, put an aisle in the middle here that uh, we used not to have. So in passing all these lists around, if you would go past the aisle to the ends on both sides, it would help a lot. Thanks. Good morning. It is. We are together. We are here to look into God's word. We are here to worship. Uh, we are here to enjoy one another's faith and company. I'd call that a good morning. It certainly is a pleasure to be with you again and as always I hope that something that I will have to say uh, will encourage you in your faith, challenge you in your walk with our God and uh, help you as you live your life and walk your journey uh, with our Savior. We are in the midst of a series which is entitled Primeval Patriarchs. Uh, life lessons from our past. And when we say our past, we mean way back in our past, uh, way back at the beginning. And so in this series, uh, we're looking at uh, people who led their family or their tribe, people like Adam and Cain and Seth and Enoch and Noah and Ham and Nimrod and Abraham, Lot, Isaac, Jacob, Esau, Joseph, and Moses. Relax, not all this morning. This is talking about the series. <laughs> and so uh, we will see both positive and negative life lessons in this series. We'll learn about God's expectations for fathers. And I think that we can extend that out to include grandfathers and great-grandfathers, and if by chance and age any great-great-grandfathers we have among us, uh, we will learn about male spiritual leadership in the home and church. We'll learn the meaning of patriarch. We will learn the tragic result in home, church, and nation when fathers are absent or when they fail in their God-given role. And uh, in many ways, that is, uh, to a degree, what we begin looking at today as uh, we begin looking. Um, this was uh, an illustration that I thought might be useful to our study today. If it's difficult for you to read, especially for those who are joining us online, it says, if you want children to keep their feet on the ground, put some responsibility on their shoulders. So that comes from a comment from Dear Abby. So Abigail Van Buren. Uh, have you found that to be basically true in your own life and in the life of raising children? I know that it was with my own children. That's not where I want to be. 
and I thought there was another slide in between there, so apparently not. During the, uh, the excavation years ago of the city of Nineveh, which for many, many years, scholars said did not exist, uh, when archaeologists were digging in the ruins of that city, they came upon a library of plaques containing the laws of the realm. And one of the laws uh, read, in effect, that anyone guilty of neglect would be held responsible for the result of his, re of his neglect. Let me read that for you again. Anyone guilty of neglect would be held responsible for the result of that neglect. If you fail to teach your child to obey, if you fail to teach him to respect the property of others, you and not he are responsible for the result of your neglect. So if junior or juniorette go and they damage the property of somebody else and they are nabbed in the act and they are brought before the magistrate and it is discovered that you as the adult, the parent, have neglected to train them and to teach them to respect the property of someone else, then you are the one who is held responsible. So you're going to have to pay in order to repair that property or maybe to uh, absorb whatever punishment would be enacted because of what they have done. Responsibility is defined by Oxford as the state or fact of having a duty to deal with something or having control over someone. Let's break that down. Having a duty means having an obligation. Well, that clarifies everything. Having a duty has, means having an obligation. It's something we have to do or something that is expected of us. This expectation may be placed upon us by others, or we may accept that, uh, that expectation or place it upon ourselves. Once we have accepted this responsibility, we are expected to follow through with it, to see it completed, to take responsibility for it. Now let's look at the second part of that Oxford definition. That is having control over something, some action, or someone. This control can be over our children, for example, over a team at work, over a group, or over any time that people are put under our care. This expectation with this control is that we have the ability to handle this responsibility and can guide and guard those who are placed under our control. Now, not everyone who is placed in a position of responsibility is up to that position of responsibility. Whether it is dealing with an action, a person, or a circumstance. And we've all experienced that in our lives. We, this morning, are looking at Adam and his responsibility. Let me begin by saying that Adam was up to the responsibility that was placed upon him. Certain things were placed within his care. 
certain activities, certain animals, certain people, expectations were given regarding those things by God. And we're going to take a, a look at those this morning. But we do have to understand responsibility. And hopefully, responsibility is something that we have understood ever since we were small children. Things that we learned in kindergarten. Such things as keeping our promises. Showing self-control. Admitting our mistakes. Working well with others. Planning ahead. Doing what we say we will do taking care of things, setting goals, helping others, being on time, and doing things when they are expected to be done. All of that is a part of being responsible. Now, being responsible can take us to places that perhaps we did not expect. And maybe, oh, there it is. Well, that's not the person I expected. I have to take responsibility and say that this is not what I had planned. Yes, I want to skip the ad, but I also want to make sure that we have some, some sound. That is one thing that was my responsibility, but I did not check it before class started. It worked fine on my laptop before I plugged it into all of this. But let's see. There's still no sound. Maybe the problem is with me. Let's go up to sound. Oh, look, look at that sound. We're going to take it up here. It's going to be loud. Okay, we'll bring it down. And here we go. Let's try this. Uh, not loud. So my question is, who did it? Who's the culprit? We got a couple options. Let's see. We got Jeff. And we got Dina. What about Tank? I wonder if Tank had anything to do with it. Tank, do you know about the trash? Yeah. Do you know anything about the trash, Tank? Yeah. Because uh, I don't know who could have done something like that. I mean, you're the adult, you're in charge, and yet somehow the trash got into you. Can you tell me what happened? Yeah, you tell me what happened. Ah, sit down. Tank, sit down. Okay. Brother made me do it. Yes. Sometimes it's it's not too difficult to find the guilty party. All of the evidence pointed to uh, to one particular dog, but we do have to understand that uh, okay now let's try this again thank you that ultimately we do have to all take responsibility um, let's look at this for just a moment uh, let's describe a situation where someone has depended upon you Okay. I've had children depend on me. Yes. And at times they've been more dependent, haven't they? And now I'm dependent on them. Ah. Uh, <laughs> okay, another situation. Being a school teacher. Yes.
certainly. Can you hear that? Running an organization. So in the, in the business world, Very good. Teaching. Pardon. I did not watch the 700 Club, but one day it was on, and someone asked Mr. Pat if uh, baptism was necessary. He said, well, it is a command, but it's not, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought about writing an engaging letter <laughs> about, do you know what you've done? Yes. Yeah. So telling others about Christ and and uh, the illustration here was watching television and the question is asked, uh, is baptism necessary? And the answer of uh, of Mr. Pat was, well, it is a command, but it is not necessary. So uh, and the understanding would be how many people by listening to that, uh, came away with the understanding that they do not have to be baptized. And, and of course, the responsibility of having sent them away without being obedient to the truth of the gospel. Uh, our spouse may depend upon us for a great many things. Yes. Some more than others. And I find myself very dependent upon my spouse. I freely admit it. Uh, discuss a time when you were responsible for something. Yes. Following instructions. Okay. Following instructions. The nuclear trigger. The nuclear trigger. Now there is a fair amount of responsibility in in that. Well, this is not quite the same as a nuclear trigger, but those of us who've seen your aim are making bread and providing breakfast Saturday morning for the workforce. Yes. So responsible for providing a meal for our guests. Yes. As females, I find every time I get up in the morning, I'm responsible for something. Yes, every morning. <laughs> Even by the time you get into bed, there, there are still more. Yes. Okay, what makes some people... Now we're going to get into the thick of it. What makes some people more responsible than others? <laughs> Bigger shoulders. <laughs> yes, it does. And, for example, as parents, we recognize that, don't we? We, we choose certain uh, responsibilities that are appropriate to the age and maturity of our children. But even children of the same age, sometimes one may be more responsible than other than the other, correct? Why is that? Because they didn't grow up. They didn't grow up? Mm hmm. Okay, so the younger one uh, learns by watching the older one and seeing the result of the things that he does wrong and doesn't do them. I asked the older one one day if he liked sitting in the corner or getting his block or whatever. He said, uh, well, I just want to be me. And I said, well, that's not always successful, is it? And it, it took him several years, but one day he went to his mother and he said, I want to be good. And he has grown. Maybe by watching the fact that his younger brother didn't sit in the corner as often. 
Uh huh. I resemble that remark. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, is there anyone in here who, who does not know the story of Adam and Eve? It's okay if you don't. Okay, so I'm going to assume that we all know the story of Adam and Eve. And we, we know about the creation. We know about uh, them being placed in the garden. We know about their sin. And we know about their exile from the garden. So we're not going to read all of the text, but I do want us, based upon our understanding of that text, to draw out some lessons from our patriarch about what God expects of us, his expectations, and therefore what responsibilities may exist for us based upon responsibilities that were given to Adam. So let's look at uh, Adam and his initial responsibilities. After everything else had been created, God made man and gave him the responsibility over all of creation. On the sixth day, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. If, if you want to open your Bibles, our basic text is Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 3. And, and we will be pulling in some other texts which help us to understand our theme today. Man was given an intelligence which was higher than anything else that had been created. And so God gave him responsibility to rule over all of creation. That did not mean that Adam could do anything that he so pleased with creation. Because God dictated to Adam what he was to do with that creation. He was told to take care of it. In chapter 2 and in verse 15, God tells Adam that he was put, or he tells us, that he was put into the garden to work it and to keep it. The two Hebrew words that we have in our text in that verse are the Hebrew words abad and shamar. Abad, as you can see up at the top, sometimes we will find, depending on the, the translation that we are working with, uh, here we have the word cultivate, and that is the word abad, which means to serve, or to work. It's used in Genesis here and again after they left the garden to show the responsibility that Adam and Eve had to the earth, both to work it and to serve it. The same word abad is used throughout the Old Testament to describe what kings were to do for the people. They were to serve the people and what the citizens were to do for their king. They were to serve their king. And then secondly, they are told to keep the garden and to keep the ground. And that is the word shamar, which means to watch over, to keep, or to guard. This word is used to describe Adam's role in the garden. It's also the word that's used to describe what the cherubim with the flaming sword was to, to do once the man and the woman were cast out of the garden. 
It is a commonly used word to show what God's people are to do with God's covenant and with his commandments. They are to keep it. They are to guard it. They are to show dignity toward it and do whatever it takes to make sure that it is followed and that it remains pure and true. That is what the word shamar is about. So we have somewhat of an understanding of what God is saying the responsibility of Adam and Eve is at this point. These commands together show that Adam and Eve were to work the garden, they were to care for it, they were to serve it, they were to guard it, and they were to protect it. This included all living things. Adam was further given the responsibility of naming all of the animals of the earth. You remember that part of the story, don't you? One by one, they are brought to Adam, and God is looking to see what Adam will name them. And the name that Adam gives to them is the name that they shall be called. Now, the word uh, for name here is the word Shem, or in its root, Shiim, which means to characterize or to position something. And by naming them and placing them in a certain position, Adam is at the same time placed in a position over them and thereby given responsibility for these animals. He's been given a duty to keep them from harm and to help them so that they also can multiply as God has directed them to do in Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 22. God delegated this responsibility for creation to Adam and to all of mankind. Now, recognizing this so far about Adam's initial responsibility, how does possession of something create responsibility over it? Okay. Elaborate on that for me, please. Okay. If you, I missed the first part. Okay. Okay. Yes, that's right. You, you give the child a dog and you've got to feed the dog. You've got to water the dog. You've got to clean up after the dog. Not as in the video, but even what it leaves behind, right? And so possessing something means you have a responsibility for it. If we own a vehicle... Are we not responsible for that vehicle and our operation of that vehicle? We are. If we possess a, think about the law in the Old Testament. If we possess a portion of land, and on that land there is a pit, and somebody falls into that pit, are we responsible for that person falling into that pit on our land? Yes, we are. Because we did not take care of our property. Uh, what responsibility do we as mankind have for God's creation? Yes. 
look at that from two different ways. The lonely environmental potential, climate change potential, <coughs> say that this creature here is the target of the man that didn't really want to. They blame this creature for people not really feeling like they should take care of things. Of course, it is growing here. Okay, let, let me repeat that first part, and then you can put in the second part so that everybody hears it. Okay, so hold the thought, please. Uh, so uh, some people who uh, may be, for example, of the environmentalist uh, way of thinking would uh, criticize and say that those who uh, believe and, and follow this scripture would point to it and say, we possess it, possess it, and so we can do anything we want with it and thereby do harm to it in any way we choose. Okay? Exploit it for profit, okay. Okay. So people who more rightly understand this text, who uh, are more uh, concerned with conservation, are going to take those steps which preserve uh, nature and other things so that it continues to be a blessing, not only to our generation, but they look to the future for others to be able to use. Almost as though it would be sinful to destroy it for money. A Almost as if it would be sinful to destroy it for money. Yeah, to exploit it for money. I did not. Okay. I know the name. Okay. He just said he learned responsibility from the Jersey Milk Cow. <laughs> <laughs> so Charles Hodge said he learned responsibility from a Jersey Milk Cow. <laughs> Seven days a week. Seven days a week. <laughs> Twice a day. <laughs> yes. So uh, in, in looking at responsibility uh, for God's creation, we have to recognize, as was pointed out, from a conservationist sort of, of view or from the, the view of a farmer, let's say, that with his land, that uh, it, it's something that needs to be protected uh, so that it can be used for the future, that uh, we are to be more or less caretakers of it. Okay? So we... We live in a world which is very polarized. We all understand that, politically and otherwise. And so uh, people go to extremes on, on both sides of almost any issue, including this one. Then, uh, secondly, 
you know, God cares for birds and knows when a sparrow falls. Mm -hmm. But he cares more for people. Yes. And we, we need to follow God's priority system in, in taking care of our creation. Yes, we do. We need to have the same priorities that God has in recognizing that people are more important than animals. Just repeating for, <laughs> for those who are watching in case they didn't hear it. I'm not sure exactly how much they hear. So, uh, very good point. So, um, let's look for a couple of minutes at Adam's changing responsibility. Adam needed a helper. And so Eve was created for him. She was given responsibility alongside of Adam to be fruitful and to multiply and to subdue the earth. The word uh, subdue in the Hebrew is the word kabash. Now, um, are, are we familiar with the word kabash or kabash? Has anybody here ever used the word kabash in a sentence? I have to remember that I'm in Texas and I'm not up north anymore. <laughs> but people up in, in Yankee land <laughs> use this word quite a bit. My father used it a lot. Uh, you know, for example, uh, me and my brother were, were in the house having a pillow fight and... Uh, Every, we were hitting each other, feathers were flying everywhere, and then all of a sudden we knocked over a lamp, and uh, my mother heard it, and she came in, and she put the kabosh on that, uh, would be the way that we would use it in a sentence, okay? Uh, th there are all sorts of etymologies as to how it came into American usage from, from uh, both the Irish as well as from... Uh, uh, Arabs, but going back to the Hebrew, uh, as we are in this, as you look up there, it means to take control or to bring into bondage, which would be what a mother would do in that situation. She would, uh, she would subdue the situation and take control over it. But the word uh, was really kind of a, uh, used of a harsh action. Uh, because it described what a king might do with a, a very great enemy uh, in the sense of using an army in a war. Well, you can imagine that in the midst of a pillow fight as well. But it, it really means to very strongly take control over something. And so... Uh, that is what Adam and Eve were told to do. They were told to go out and to subdue the earth. The responsibility to subdue the earth was passed on throughout the generations and it was repeated to the children along with the responsibility to care and to protect the earth. Now, what does that mean for us? We are to be responsible with our treatment of animals and plant life, God gave us the earth as a resource, but he placed it under our protection as well. And so we have a responsibility to keep it from undue harm. Unfortunately, Adam failed with his responsibility and did not keep evil out of the garden. Instead, he, he allowed the serpent to enter and to speak with his wife and his wife to speak with the serpent. He did not subdue, protect the situation. And so she ate of the tree and she gave it to her husband and he ate of the tree and they both in that way sinned against God. By not following his commands, they chose instead to be like God, knowing good from evil. Now their sin went beyond simply not, 
not eating from or eating from the tree that God told them not to eat from. It's more than simply, please don't eat the daisies. But rather, their sin carried with it the idea of trying to be like God. And then their sins just compounded one upon the other. So that when God shows up on the scene, Adam does not take responsibility for the situation. But rather, he says, the woman that you gave me. And then the woman, in turn, said, well, the serpent is the one who told me that it was going to be good for me to eat of this. So we have this whole denial of responsibility that's going on. And so from that time onward, people have very often refused to take responsibility for their own sin even when face-to-face -face with their own maker. And there is damage which is done in a home. There is damage which is done in a society when people do not take responsibility for themselves, whether it be from a Jersey milk cow, whether it be from doing chores in the home, whether it be getting in trouble for the things which they have done and then their siblings observe. That when people do not take responsibility, we can be sure that bad things are going to happen. This is a wide brush stroke. But understand what I'm saying. Instead of holding themselves responsible for misfortune, more Americans now blame others. In past economic depressions, murder rates went down and suicides went up because Americans who had been trained on Puritan ethic of self-reliance and internal restraint blamed themselves for personal economic failure. Now when people reach a breaking point in frustration over economic depression or hardship, they lash out at others. Now, in our story today, they lashed out at others. So this is not a new thing. But we live in a society and we are surrounded by families where responsibility is not a priority. And when Adam and Eve did not take responsibility, things just continued to go downhill. And when we do not take responsibility for ourselves, when we do not take responsibility for our possessions, when we do not take responsibility for things which are placed under our care, then we are doing damage to ourselves, for we are created in the image of God. We do damage to our families, to our children, to our children's children, and to our society. Responsibility really is a big deal. And when we look into the life of the patriarchs, we will very often find them not taking the responsibility that they ought to. And it goes back to the very beginning. We know the rest of the story, that Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden because of their sin. And their sin 
brought death into the world. And we, according to Romans chapter 5, like our primeval patriarchs, have all chosen sin for ourselves. Rather than keeping and guarding the command and the covenant that we have with God, we have, in the freedom which God has given us, chosen rather to sin. And so the result is ultimately separation from God and death. But thanks be to God that through our Lord Jesus Christ and by his grace we have forgiveness of our sins and we can start anew. But brothers and sisters, I want to encourage us as the people of God to be responsible in all that we do. Responsible, yes, for our past sinfulness by being truly repentant and doing onwardly what is right and helping our families and helping those around us to know what God desires and what he commands. May we all be blessed in the knowledge of this and may we be strengthened in our faith and in our communion with our God. Tim, thank you very much for a very good lesson. We have quite, quite a few on our prayer list. Uh, Ramona Bright, and she is struggling to breathe. And Thanksgiving for the sunshine. Uh, Cleta Cook, <coughs> Lois Neal has COVID. The Habashi in Lubbock, <laughs> in Lubbock, in Egypt. <coughs> the Charleston's from Scotland. Lee Towns. Brian Garrett, who is a AIM instructor, is a back procedure. And for the SIBI workshop, Brooklyn Boyer, Tanya Combest, and Jeanette Cravey is going to have double eye surgery this coming Tuesday. Nancy Hardsheimer is in rehab after a fall in surgery. Wanda Parker fell and broke her hip, and she has had COVID. And Kevin's sister, Beth Haynes Breyer, has decided to have no more treatments for her leukemia. Brenda Simmons is having a scan Monday morning to see the extent of the cancer area that needs to be removed and it'll tell if the cancer has spread or not. Harry, would you come lead us in our prayer? Our Father in heaven, Father, we are blessed today with a beautiful day. And we know you're our God, and I know you gave it to us. And we thank you. May we use it, Father, in your service, being responsible as a saint, as a priest, to look for opportunities where we might take your word and open the doors for other people to better know you. Father, we have many on our prayer list. We ask your hands, Father, on each of them, especially, Father, for Jeanette Cravey and her double eye surgery. We do pray for success. 
Father, in all of these cases, we pray for the caregivers, for it is hard on them day after day after day to look after that one that they so much love. We ask you also, Father, for memories and thoughtfulness of the, the Anderson family as they've lost a loved one. Help us to look over them at this time as well. Father, we ask you to be in our hearts, on our minds, and on our lips, for we are to be your worship every day. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.